Uh, my name is Steve Winnick, and I'm the convener of the music and song section of the American Folklore Society. And uh, one of the great thrills of that job, in fact, it's the only great thrill of that job, <laughs> is, that, <laughs> is that every year we get to host the annual Phillips Barry Lecture, uh, which means that we get to invite dominant in the field uh, to come and talk about their work, uh, particularly in the, in the realm of music and song. And uh, it's been a wonderful way to continue uh, the work of, of great scholars in our discipline. There are some in the room who've given the Phillips Barry Lecture in the past. I'm looking at Jim. <laughs> and uh, and it's, it's nice to have them here. And there's, uh, there is, uh, is a great tradition behind the Phillips Barry Lecture that we love to continue. And last year at the meeting, the, the way we do it is we have our section meeting each year. And we talk about possible candidates for the next year's lecture. And last year, the idea of doing something a little bit different came up, and that was to ask Rosalie to do this. And it's only different in that usually the person that we ask is a, uh, an academic who's a member of the society, as opposed to someone whose who's primary uh, love and, and primary job has been performing. But we thought Rosalie had done so much, not only as a singer of traditional songs and as a songwriter, uh, but also as a collector and working with, uh, with folklorists for, for a, a great career that it would be really interesting to bring her in, particularly because she's a native just of this place. She's from just outside Boise, and, and, uh, and we knew she'd, she'd be here, and it would be a local thing that we could do as well. And so we came to the decision to invite Rosalie, and we're very happy that she said yes, and here she is. So I won't do much in terms of introducing Rosalie because we're going to start out with some biographical questions, and so she'll She'll kind of introduce herself in that way. But uh, just to say who she is briefly, she's a, a performer, singer, songwriter, uh, singer of traditional songs who's been doing this for a good many years. And she's been associated with this region uh, and with collecting and performing and interpreting songs of this region for many years. And we're very pleased to have Rosalie Sorrells. <laughs> So since you are from Idaho, um, why don't you talk a little bit about your, your childhood here in, in Idaho? My childhood. Well, I'm just entering it. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was, I was born here of poor because honest parents. Poor because honest parents. I stole that from Ambrose Bierce, actually. <laughs> I thought it was one of the great openings to a sh short story. I, I was born of poor because honest parents. And I, I actually know that most people don't read short stories anymore, so I'm likely to get away with it each year without anybody knowing, but I just always blab and tell her I got it. Ambrose Beers was pretty great. <laughs> maybe, you're, maybe you're also poor because honest. I don't know. What's that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was I was born uh, uh, in 1933, which is a bad year for uh, everybody. And uh, but uh, my parents were already poor, so they didn't notice what a pain in the neck it was. <laughs> and I didn't grow up feeling. Uh, cheated or betrayed or anything. I grew up feeling great. If they didn't have it, they knew how to make it. <laughs> if they needed to get somewhere, they knew how to find a way to do it. And, you know, they were just fantastic parents. My father drank too much. You were telling me, yeah. Yes. He's a one of my best influences in that area. <laughs> and uh, he also was from another planet, I believe. I loved showing him off. He could walk on his hands for two blocks. And he did it all the time. I, I loved it when he did it. He, he and I'd go out for walks, and, and then he'd just be walking along saying good morning to people, and suddenly he'd walk along on his hands and say good morning to people. And they would, you know, I'd do huge double takes, and, and he would just pretend like there was nothing weird at all about that. And uh, let's see, what else could he do? He was a really good hunter and fisherman, and he wanted a boy, so he'd 
just tried to teach me how to be one. He took me out and taught me how to shoot and how to fish. And, and uh, when I was about 11, he, he was going to teach me how to be a mighty deer hunter. And we went out, and he, he got a shot off at this deer and, and knocked it down, but it didn't die. And he said very seriously to me, if that happens, you have to be able to do this or you can't shoot at a deer. And he took a knife and cut its throat. I said, Daddy, I can't do that. <laughs> so I never had to deal with it again. But, but I knew how to skin a deer and cut it up and eat it. And uh, he, he taught me how to do... Mm, how to, how to take a roof apart and, and take it off, you know, and, and uh, how to straighten the nails and put them in a can so you could use them again, all kinds of boy stuff. And what about your mother? She was a big influence, too. My mother. <laughs> my mother was a whole mm -hmm. other... Uh, my mother was um, a really great mother, and... and uh, uh, very good at that, but but she wasn't a conventional kind of mother, and, and she taught me to read when I could see, almost, you know, <laughs> and uh, made me memorize long poems and uh, great big pieces of Shakespeare. Her father loved Shakespeare. He was a farmer, and, and he used to uh, quote Shakespeare while he was uh, separating the milk. And he also sang at Separator Temple, everything. And, uh, and he made me learn all the soliloquies from Hamlet when I was five. You know, imagine a, a little kid piping up and saying, uh, Oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt, thaw, and resolve itself into a dew, or that the everlasting had not fixed his cannon against self-slaughter. <laughs> she taught me that. That's rough. Did, did, you, did you understand it at the time? The, all oh, that? yeah, she made sure I understood it, mm -hmm. and so did my grandfather. He was, he was really graphic about some of that stuff. <laughs> And not only that, he really hated it if you messed around with Shakespeare. And she told me that when she was in grade school, uh, she was supposed to learn uh, one of those, one of those, I think it was Mrs. Shakespeare, <laughs> Mrs. Mrs. Macbeth's uh, thing about the, where she sees the knife. What, what's the out, out, down spot. Yeah, but it, but it starts at. Is this a dagger that I see before yeah. me? It's handled toward my hand. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He, he was uh, he was very proud of the fact that I knew that all the way through. But but he w would read them with great gusto. And, and uh, anyway, she was supposed to bring some of those home. And and the the reading Shakespeare. Uh, th those small books that they, that they put one play in at a time, all, always red leather bound with gold stamping. The uh, school edition that they had had taken all the dirty words out. <laughs> and there's a whole lot in Macbeth, you know, the, the nurse is just always going on and on about all kinds of things that children should not know about, I guess some of those people thought. But, my grandfather, on the other hand, thought you should not mess with Shakespeare, and so when she <laughs> brought this reading copy home, and he said, what's this? They've left out blah, 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 this, you know. And he starts putting on his very best clothes and, and uh, getting himself all ready to go to school and, and protest this. <laughs> and my mother, who was already really upset about what my grandmother made her wear to school, which was Lyle stockings and all kinds of, you know, things to disguise the fact that she's a female person, <laughs> got down on her knees and said, oh, Daddy, please don't go to school and, and tell them not to take the dirty parts out of Shakespeare. <laughs> they already are really upset with me <laughs> because of other things. Oh, Daddy, please. And he didn't. He didn't go, but he mumbled about it a lot. <laughs> yeah, 
that's yeah. some, some of my sh yeah, childhood. Now, now all these parents and, and grandparents that you're talking about were, were real Westerners. And, oh, absolutely. And it, and it speaks to the love of poetry that is, that is a big part of, of the culture here in the West. Yeah. Um, is that part of what got you into songs as well? No, I don't think so. I, I wanted uh, to be an opera singer. I, I told you that in the mm -hmm. last thing. I, I loved, everybody loved opera, and I wanted to, I had a high voice, and I wanted to sing like Vidu Sayal. And if any of you were here before, you know that uh, when I was 14, my batty old great aunts, Aunt Mary and Aunt Beatrice down in L.A., took me to see La Boheme with, with Bidou Sayal and, um, and Juicy Burling, who was one of the greatest tenors who ever lived. And, and when Bidou Sayal opened her mouth and sang, I thought, Well, if I can't sing them like that, I'm not going to sing them. That's it. <laughs> I gave up the whole idea of me. And then I decided I'd be a jazz singer, and I fell in love with Billie Holiday, and I couldn't do that either. I ended up being whatever I am, which is not exactly a folk singer, actually, but it's, uh, it includes a lot of that. And at the same time, you also did theater. I mean, your, this love of Shakespeare bloomed a little bit in your teens, yeah, I understand. I did that. I love doing theater, and I, I actually love performing. I, I really liked singing for people, and I got better at it. I used to babysit for a couple of people who taught uh, classical s singing to uh, a bunch of people in town, and they, and they paid me for the babysitting with voice lessons, which is not apparent in the way I sing now, but I could hit a... I couldn't hit a high C but clubs. Hmm. But I've gotten so I like the low registers better anyhow. <laughs> now when you eventually uh, married and, and moved to Salt Lake City, uh, was that a big deal to leave, to leave this town and to leave Idaho for you? I didn't want to go. And I didn't like Salt Lake City for a long time. I got so I loved it, I stayed there quite a while. And, and I started collecting songs and collected a whole lot of Mormon songs. They were really interesting. And uh, I grew to like it very much. I still, my brother lives there and I go there a lot to see him. And, and I like Salt Lake City, but and uh, other friends of mine live in Salt Lake City. <laughs> there they are. <laughs> a lot of friends there, and, and uh, it's a beautiful place. But I, I didn't want to leave home. I really didn't, unless I could go to New York City or something like that, which I have now done, and I like it there too. You know. It's a whole lot easier for me to adapt. <laughs> Now that I'm entering my second childhood, and, and uh, I just didn't want to leave my my parents or the cabin or you know all the things in my life that had been just it just seemed like I, I needed to be in those places. You know, the, my sense of place was really pretty strong. And, Tell us about the cabin a little bit, because you were telling me about it. And yeah, I live there now. Uh, I mean, we lived in a house in Boise, but my my father's mother and father bought this piece of land the year before I was born, and um, my grandfather built a cabin that was washed away in a flood some years later, just maybe when I was in grade school, I think, and, and Dad was going to try to rebuild the cat, that place, but it was just so, so gone. I mean, you know, the floors collapsed and the walls fell in, and, and there was no really putting it back together, and, and Dad was not a carpenter. He was an engineer, and he got to looking at it and thought if a, if a big bunch of water came and washed that away, and I build another one there, a big bunch of water will come and wash it away again. That's dumb. So he, so he put it at the other end of the flat, where there's a, 
a hill that deflects the water. There is never, not a bit of water, even when we've had really big floods, has come into that house. He knew what he was up to. And he, uh, he built it all by hand. He cut every log. He made every brick. He built the downstairs, and then he built the upstairs. And I, I said my favorite line about it the last time, so if you were here, you're going to hear it again. My mother stamped her tiny foot and said, <laughs> Walter, I am not living in that house unless there's a bathroom and a kitchen. <laughs> and he thought he could p cook perfectly well outside on a fire, you know. <laughs> but he put on a kitchen and a bathroom. They're a little bit strange, but they work. And uh, then he put this marvelous tin roof on it. It's a double tin roof. And, uh, and it, it does really, really interesting things with deflecting the heat and, uh, and yet keeping it in uh, so that it's warm in the winter and cool in the summer. Yeah. Yeah, but my mother had my mother had that same hunger, and she never did. And she taught me how to go other places in books. I mean, she really taught me how to go any place in the world, reading and and in poetry. And it was pretty satisfactory to me. I I dreamed of going places, and eventually I went. You know, I went to Europe and. And uh, I went to Canada a lot. I've been a whole lot of places, and, and uh, I always love that, but I always want to go home. I, I don't think I've ever lost that, uh, that connection to home is so strong. I, I just, I don't think I could stand it if I didn't think I was going to go back there pretty soon. And, and leaving home wasn't ever as important to me as, I mean, I, I'll tell you. I never wanted to run away from home. I never wanted to get away from my parents. They were the most interesting people I ever met. And not only that, they and all my uncles and all my relatives, and I particularly want to say all the men, treated me like I was the most interesting person they ever met and I could do anything I was smart enough or strong enough to do. And I just loved that. I didn't know men were supposed to be awful until I grew up and married one. You know. <laughs> so, so, so I, d I didn't want to run away. I wanted to see everything, but, but I could see it pretty well anyway. I mean, I, it wasn't that much different. I mean, I was totally knocked out by Dorothy Parker and people like that and the, and the round table. I could almost see the Algonquin in the round. And I went there. That's the first place I went when I went to New York. I went and had a martini at the, at the Algonquin Club and communed with their spirits, you know. So, so that's really true. I, I, I never felt like I had to get out of, out of the, here. I mean, maybe the town, but, <laughs> but not the place. Now, wh when did you start paying attention to and collecting traditional songs? Was it before you left, or was it after you were in Salt Lake? It was after I was in Salt Lake in terms of thinking of it as that. I mean, I knew a lot of, uh, there are people in my family who sang a lot of traditional mm -hmm. songs that I just knew. And, uh, and I listened to a lot of people who, who uh, my mother and father liked Burl Ives and uh, Joseph Murray and Miranda, which was kind of pop music in the folk world then. <coughs> But uh, but I had been to a whole lot of old fiddle parties at, at my grandmother and grandfather's house, and, and people would stay up all night and sing long ballads in the middle of the night, and I, I knew some of those. And uh, I don't know whether I could call one of those particular ones back, but I learned how to learn them as I heard them. I mean, they, they really stuck with me. Every time I heard people telling stories in song, I have a hard time separating 
songs that I love in different disciplines and say, oh, well, I can't sing that because I'm a folk singer and that's not a folk song. I, I just can't handle that. It doesn't work for me. <laughs> I'm folk and I can, you know, I'm, I'm a folks and, and I can sing, call whatever I sing a folk song because I'm a folk. That's it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, would you would you mind singing us one was something that you collected at some point that you found uh, in your travels? Well, I'm, I was trying to think of, uh, of something from my family to sing to you. I mean, my grandfather knew more versus my mother's father, the Irish one. He knew more verses to the bastard king of England than any other living human <laughs> being, my father said, but I can't, I'm not supposed to remember those. But, uh, let's see. What's one of those lullabies? They're, they're great lullabies that they sang. Oh, it's, it's hard to just pull pull one out and say, this is what it is, you know, because they, they did mess them all up and mm -hmm. sing different words to them, and that's what makes folk songs real folk songs, is when you don't sing it right. I don't care what anybody tells you about having to sing it the traditional way. That's not traditional, you know. <laughs> it, it's, it's a folk song because it changes, or that, that's the fascinating thing. Well, last time if you it sang lasts, it, a, a really nice one with had some of those maverick verses that that move around. Uh, oh yeah, the the love the love song verses. Yeah. Let me see. It was oh where was I last Fourth of July? Yeah, right? that's the yeah. one. Yeah, yeah. I learned that from an old man named Walter Turner. And and we were talking about old songs and story songs and everything, and he said. Oh, I can't remember those old songs. And then he looked off and he says, Oh, where was I last 4th of July? <laughs> a drinking of good. That's too high. I can't get that <laughs> Thomas. Oh, where was I last 4th of July? A drinking of good wine. A talking to some pretty little pink who broke this heart of mine. Her lips was like some rose a bud that bloometh in the month of June. Her voice was like fine instruments that's highly put in tune. And the blackest crow that ever flew shall change his colors white. And if I prove false to you, bright day shall turn to night. And who will kiss your lips, my love? And who will glove your hand? And who will kiss your red rosy cheeks when I'm in a far off land? Well, I have a father and he'll shoe my feet. My mother will glove my hand, and you may kiss my lips, my love, when you're back from the foreign land. Where was I last Fourth of July? A drinking of good wine, a talking to some pretty little pink who's broke this heart of mine. I love that for a number of reasons, one of which is that, of course, in North Carolina, they have that song, and it's roving on a winter's night, and so the, the, the season has changed, the yeah. 4th of July, but it's great to have that. That's the only time I've heard it with that beginning, oh, where was I last 4th of July? It's a great Yeah, and I left out some it. verses, too, that are really traditional, uh, because uh, I can't always remember what I just sang minutes ago, which I just did, <laughs> but, but, but there's some verses that you've probably heard in, in 20 or 30 other songs. Uh, uh, just describing the hills. Let's see. The hills will, fl will fly. 
no, I can't get it back now. Yeah, those are those are gone. verses from Ten Thousand Miles yeah. and My Dearest Dear and yeah, My Love's Like it, a Red Red Rose. It has rose, that verse about those, yeah. um, and if I go ten thousand, I'll come back. If I go ten thousand more, yeah. you know, it's uh, it's just verses that you've heard over and over in different songs with a different tune. But that tune is is also one that you would hear other songs sung to. And, and that's one of the things that's so great about it. When somebody sings you a, a traditional tune and you learn it without recording it or without having any reference to go back to, you remember it the way it sounded to you like something else sometimes. And you just change it without meaning to at all. And that's when those transitions come. Some songs just undergo I mean, the, the, the one that is, there's this really great album called The Unfortunate Rake. And it's, uh, I think there's 27 versions or so of that song, which eventually becomes uh, the, the uh, St. James Infirmary Blues, and then it becomes the Streets of Laredo. And there's a whole lot of uh, parodies of it and, and different, and it's, it's sung by, just some old guy sitting on a stump in a couple of cases, and then some professional singers like Dave Van Ronk and uh, Alan Lomax sings one. And, uh, you know, there are a and couple I, of I have to point out that, that Jan Brun Van sang one. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Yeah. I know. Right. And my version is my, my husband was uh, worked for the telephone company, and, and he. Uh, uh, he learned this from a, a boomer lineman named Russ Russell. Russ Russell uh, would not wear the safety belt because he said it was an unsafe piece of equipment. Uh, when you went out and drank all all night, you'd sometimes you'd go to put the thing uh, around your waist and you'd take the uh, the clip and, and clip it onto your pliers instead of the D ring you were supposed to put it into, and, and then you would lean back at 90 feet and, and just fall down and break your neck or something. But, but uh, I'll, I'll sing you that version. I, I really quite like it. I, I think I'll remember it again. He was, he was a lineman in uh, Burley, Idaho, my husband. And, and uh, so was Russ, and that's where he got it. As I walked out in the streets of old Burley, as I walked out in Burley one day, I spotted a young lineman all wrapped in white linen. He was wrapped in white linen and cold as the clay. I see by your scarce trap that you are a lineman. Words he did say as I boldly walked by. A scare strap is the the strap that you put into the D rings to hold you under. Come sit down beside me and hear my sad story. I fell off a pole and I know I must die. Twas once up the poles I used to go dashing. Once up the poles, I used to go gay. First up the 60s and then up the 90s, but I fell off an 18 and I'm dying today. That's the height of the poles, the 60-foot ones and the 90-foot ones. The 90-foot ones always had three crossbars on them, and they're way up there. And, and they had joint-use poles uh, that were 90 feet long where the the uh, power company uh, uh, shared the, the use with the uh, telephone company. And the 60-foot poles only had telephone lines. The 18-foot poles were already six feet into the ground. I mean, if you fell off of one of those, it was just sort of a bump, you know. <laughs> fell off an 18 and I'm dying today. Go ring the phone softly and climb the pole slowly and check your D-rings when you go aloft. Keep up your, keep your hooks sharpened and grease up your scare strap cause I'm telling you buddy that ground ain't so soft.
There's another verse I left out before, and I'm really trying to think of it. It's something about this, the guy who was the head of the construction. Oh, I wish I could remember it, because it's about him going into the bar and pulling the girl down on his lap and drinking himself silly when, when they when they changed all the uh, uh, the hand, you know, how the operator would plug into the hole and, and connect you with a beautiful young lady <laughs> 2,000 miles away, and all of a sudden they had this crossbar equipment and none of that happened anymore, and they just didn't even have operators, and kind of lamenting that, uh, that loss. And I just can't remember that verse. I'm sorry. <laughs> As I walked out in the streets of old Burley, as I walked out in Burley one day, I spied a young lineman all wrapped in white linen. He was wrapped in white linen and cold as the clay. The lineman's him. <laughs> Thank you. And do you recall how you how Kenny Goldstein and you sort of hooked up on that? Because Kenny Goldstein was the editor of this album that had all these versions of the unfortunate rake. Yeah, he uh, he came through. Wayland Hand was born in. Uh, you all know who Wayland was. He was really wonderful, and and uh, I got to know him very well. And he, he was born in Logan, Utah, I think, one of those towns anyway. And and uh, and he came to do a guest teaching thing for one summer, and I got to take it. And, and he just he just introduced me to that concept of how a song could be born, you know, a thousand years ago and go through all these permutations, and you could still tell where it came from when you heard it. And and that was the tune that he had. He must have had like four or five hundred versions of the streets of Laredo in various permutations. Was, and, and he talked about where that came from and what, what all of the, and how, you know, when, when the, in, in the Scottish and the, and the Irish and, and the English versions, the young man was not dying because he was shot or fell off a pole or whatever. He was dying because he had a social disease. And, uh, and uh, he would describe that in some sort of vague way, but you know there would always be talk of, of uh, various salves that he was being rubbed with, and you would find out they were for the treatment of syphilis <laughs> if, if you chased it down. And, yes, the pills of white mercury and so forth. And pills of white mercury, but but what he pointed out was that these were all Scottish and Irish and English, and as soon as they got to the United States, the people would clean it all up and make it, you know, well, maybe a bottle, but but it was full of whiskey or, you know, <laughs> a gunshot, something cleaner. <laughs> yeah, the Americans always cleaned up those old ballads. <laughs> so in addition to kind of connecting you with Kenny, Whalen Hand actually took you to to California to study with oh, him yeah, for a brief he, period. Oh yeah, he invited me to come uh, to a, a wonderful uh, three-week uh, symposium with, with all kinds of it. Herbert Halpert was there, and Bess Lomax Haas, and John Greenway, and it, it was just Ed Cray and Wayland, and and they invited a few singers in, like Brownie McGee and Sonny Terry came, and, and Bess did a wonderful short concert. And, and uh, he brought in Guy Carawan, who became a really good friend of mine, and sort of, sort of took me around and introduced me to all the, the places where they had folk music, like the, the Ash Grove in, in LA. And, and then I got to go and sing in the Ash Grove. And I found myself suddenly being a folk singer, which I had not had any idea of being. I was supposed to be a young housewife with a whole gang of children, which I was. I still am. <laughs> They're all grown up now. I have grandchildren and great-grandchildren, so the house is always active. <laughs> now, another thing you started collecting, particularly at the time you were in Utah, was the Mormon songs. 
Yeah. How did how did you get interested in that, and and what did you find when you started looking That's for that? That's what them? was there. It was just you know, places full of Mormons. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> We're not scary people Fruit at all. Fruit <laughs> observation. And they were just charmed when you wanted to know their songs. And, and I, I learned a whole lot of great Mormon songs. I, I still like the one that I sang before the best, but I, I should try and think of another one that, nah, maybe I'll just sing it anyway. You aren't all the same people that came before. Um, actually, very few of the same people are here. Yeah. So, yeah. This is really one of my favorite American folk songs. I just think it's a fabulous song. The Mormons were camped down by the green grove where the clear waters flow from the mountains above. The wind it approached all chilly and cold and we listened to the howling of those lonesome roving wolves. In the grave of the stranger we left on the plain, and down by the green grove, there forever to remain. To remember his grave, we left ashes and coals to hide him from the savages and the lonesome roving wolves. And the groans of the dying were heard in our camp. And the cold, chilly frost, it was seen on our tent. And the fear in our hearts can never be told. And we listen to the howling of those lonesome roving But early next morning, just at the break of day, the drums and the fives did play a reveille. Our meals were brought in, our baggage for to pull. And now we'll bid adieu to those lonesome roving walls. Lots of roving walls. I love that song. I just think that's a great it's, song. It's an amazing, it's such a stark yeah. piece, just great. So. During that time, you were uh, starting to collect these kinds of songs, and you were living in Salt Lake City. You also uh, became sort of a concert promoter there and, and started to bring people yeah. uh, through town. Yeah, I brought a whole bunch of really great people. I brought Jean Ritchie, and she stayed for quite a while. Her husband got sick while she was there and couldn't go anywhere, so she stayed about six weeks, and, and we got to be really great friends. When I went back east, she... She took me under her wing and introduced me to everybody. She's wonderful. And uh, Jesse the Lone Cat Fuller came. Wow. Right. Jesse the Lone Cat Fuller uh, lived in San Francisco, and he wrote the San Francisco Bay Blues that Jack Elliott used to sing. And he was really a trip. Did he bring his, <laughs> did he bring his foot Della with him? Yes, he did. He <laughs> took that everywhere. He made that. It was a... It was like a, a, a bass. He started out with a bass, and he cut it off right there. And then he put a rack of pedals and some foot things to make them work. And, and he fixed it up so he could play that the strings with 
with his foot banging on that. And then he would play a guitar as well and a, a harmonica that was around his neck. And uh, some other percussion things that he had and whistles and God knows what. And uh, I loved having him for a guest anyway. I, he, he, was, he was really game for anything. And I remember one day I was gonna have a whole bunch of people over and introduce him to all of them and have a big dinner. And, I needed to go shopping, and I said, Jesse, will you watch these children while I'm gone? And he said, yes, ma'am. I went out, and I was gone for a while, and when I got back, there were about 40 children in my kitchen. They were all stacked up on the counters and, uh, and the stove and everywhere, and, and he was in the middle of the room with all that stuff, the Fotdella and everything, <laughs> doing a concert for those children. They were all just totally... <laughs> you know, awestricken and singing along with him, and yeah. And right that at was the blues for my baby down beside the San Francisco Bay. <laughs> <laughs> and and those concerts were received well in town, and oh, everybody loved them. Mm -hmm. they, I mean, I really did well with that. I brought John Greenway, and gee, I I had a brought Jack Elliott. That's mm -hmm. when I first. Met a whole lot of the wasn't, people like Jack Wasn't Joan Baez one of the folks you yeah, brought from? Yeah, I had Jack and Joan, and uh, I, I didn't have, mostly I didn't have really well-known people, though. I, I really liked having the people who who taught everybody the, the songs that they learned, you know, and, and just seeing who, who they were. They were they were amazing people, always, and great storytellers and great guests. And I also was at that time really going around and collecting songs from people, uh, the Mormon songs, but not just that. I, I collected, oh, I know one I didn't sing before that's really great. I met this wonderful old lady that lived there. She, she was, uh, she mostly, she was a writer and, and she wrote for the Deseret News. Her name is Olive Woolly Burt. And uh, she was a tiny little thing and I think she was in her late 70s or early 80s when I met her. And she was almost 100 years old by the time she died. And she was in her 90s, you know, late 90s. And, and uh, I, I just adored her. She was so smart and so interesting. And, and she, um, her mother had crossed the plains. And, and she taught me a couple of songs that, that uh, her mother brought across the plains when, she, when the Mormons were coming in there, uh, they didn't have covered wagons. They had hand carts. They couldn't afford covered wagons. And uh, uh, one of the songs was uh, the hand cart song, which described that. And it said, oh, some will push and some will pull as we go marching up the hill and merrily on our way we go until we reach the valley of which is nothing like what it was. The, the Lonesome Rowing Wolves was a whole lot closer, but um, but she taught me one she learned from her mother. I think it's one of the prettiest things I ever heard. I sing that. This became Bruce Phillips' favorite folk song, and when he died, they had his body brought in for the the burial with a horse and and uh, uh, carrying uh, like like something you'd put a cannon on them. <laughs> and uh, this boy, this young boy I know sang this song for him. Mm -hmm. the, no, I've got to reach the cable. That's just not going to work. <laughs> My voice is sort of unpredictable. I can't ever tell what key I'm going to sing until I start trying to do it. The sweet briar and the orum brush With blossoms purple, gold, and red Are flames with voices in the bush And sacred seems the ground I tread the golden bees, the golden bees, mock 
them none's sweetest melodies. The golden bees, the golden bees, mock them none's sweetest melodies. In shadow of the wood I lie, Unwaked by dream of noisy mart Where smoke and dust soil not the sky Nor hammers beat on human heart Nor shuttles fleet, nor shuttles fleet Weave light into a winding sheet nor shuttles fleet nor shuttles fleet weave life into a winding sheet when a pale axeman strikes his stroke and takes the warm life from my breast plant by my grave a sapling old and violets of azure crest the oaken staff the oaken staff my shaft the flower my epitaph the oaken staff the oaken staff my shaft the flowers my epitaph that was beautiful and it's interesting just, just last week at the library where I, I work we had a reference question about American murder ballads, and I was able to, to recommend all of Willie Burt's book on American murder ballads, so she's... ...all about this woman. It's, he came in and found her lying in a pool of blood. She was dead, all right. <laughs> <laughs> I loved hearing her talk about that. I mean, it was so funny coming out of that face, you know, just <laughs> totally darling little old lady face would just produce the most amazing <laughs> information about murder. And I'd say, Olive, why are you so interested in murder? And she'd say, Rosalie, that's a very intimate uh, act between uh, human beings. It's very fascinating to try to understand uh, how that comes to be. <laughs> I said, gee, I wonder, I wonder what she like all by herself when she talked to herself. <laughs> so we're, I guess we have to get a little bit personal to ask about this time because you're kind of legendary for the courage you had to leave your marriage and take your five kids and go on the road. And there's been songs written about you doing that, Nancy Griffith's song, of course. Um, so do you have any comments on that, on that experience? Yeah, it really improved my life a lot. <laughs> Never thought about getting married again, but I really like the kids part. They're real, they're still great. <laughs> and I uh, never regretted that part. But I, I really recommend that everybody who's contemplating doing anything like that take at least five years to decide whether or not they want to do that and then have a whole gang of children. It's complicated, you know? <laughs> You want to know what you're doing. <laughs> ah, I think I'll sing you a kid song. All right, that'd be great. Yeah. I made this up out of things my, that came out of my children's mouth. <laughs> and it is a true song. You can sing it with me. I think that the day I made it up, it had rained and they had to come in the house and they did not want to be in the house. And uh, I, in the meantime, uh, decided I should paint the ceiling because I was trying to paint the living room all together. And, uh, and they just amused themselves by tangling themselves all up in this 
unbelievable, massive, writhing human flesh and, and poking each other in the eye and biting each other and stuff like that. And every once in a while, one or the other would disengage him or herself from this mess and uh, come over to, to tell me what the other ones were doing, which I could see perfectly well. I was on a ladder, you know, <laughs> probably up on the sixth or seventh rung. And they would get a hold of the ladder and shake it in order to get my attention. And I have vertigo. I don't need to be on a ladder at all. <laughs> and uh, that's where this song came from. This is the chorus. You can learn it really easy because you, if you know any children, you already know the words. <laughs> I'm going to tell. I'm going to tell. I'm going to holler and I'm going to yell. And I'll get you in trouble for everything you do. And I'm going to tell on you. Sick now. I'm going to tell. I'm going to tell. I'm going to holler and I'm going to yell. And I'll get you in trouble for everything you do. And I'm going to tell on you. And I'm going to tell where you hid your gun. Let's see, no, that's not the right one to start. I'm gonna tell that you busted that plate. I'll tell about all them bananas you ate. I'll tell on you one time, I'll tell on you two, and then I'm gonna tell on you. I'm gonna tell, I'm gonna tell, I'm gonna holler and I'm gonna yell and I'll get you in trouble for it. Everything you do, I'm gonna tell on you, and I'm gonna tell. What am I gonna tell next? Where you hid? No, I'm gonna tell Daddy that you suck your thumb, and I'm gonna tell what you did with your gum, and soon he'll find out about the cow and the glue, and I'm gonna. For everything you do, and I'm gonna tell on you, and I'm gonna tell that you kicked me and you bit me, and I'm gonna tell that you punched me and you hit me, and I won't tell mama what I did to you, I'm just gonna tell on you. I'm gonna tell, I'm gonna tell, I'm gonna holler, and I'm gonna yell, and I'll get you. For everything you do, and I'm gonna tell on you. <laughs> but, but you told me before that, that later on, when, when uh, asked by someone on the radio, your, your children had another impression of those days. Well, they lie a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I have to tell you that that song is the only, well, I, there's two songs I ever made any money off, and both of them are children's songs, and, and that's the, the most popular one. I mean, it's been recorded about 80 times, and people make verses up to it. I got a whole bunch of verses from, uh, from people uh, in a folk music club in New York that were all dirty verses. <laughs> and then I got a whole bunch. I yeah, used that to lends itself well to dirty verses, yeah. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I, I used to sing in prisons a lot, and all the prison guys really liked it. They just, I'm going to tell on you, is a really big deal in the prison, you know. And, and they would write verses to it. I had about 14 verses from there. And, and every time I turn around, somebody's sending me a new verse to that song. And a whole gang of children singing it is something to hear, too. I, I've sing it in school. The children like it. They don't feel the least bit like you're stealing their secrets and telling everything. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the other song is, is a lullaby. What? God. <laughs> that must have come out of my purse. No. <laughs> I didn't turn that thing off. It didn't ring. Well, anyway. <laughs> There's an island way out in the seas 
Where the babies, they all grow on trees It's jolly good fun to swing in the sun But you have to look out if you sneeze, you sneeze You have to look out if you sneeze Oh, you have to look out if you sneeze For swinging up there in the breeze if you happen to cough, you might very well fall off and you'd tumble down, flop on your knees, your knees, tumble down, flop on your knees. And when the starry winds wail and the breezes blow high in the gale, there's the funniest hopping and flopping and dropping and fat little babies just hail, they hail. Fat little babies just hail And those babies lie there in a pile And the grown-ups come after a while And they'll always pass by all them babies that cry And they take only babies that smile Smile, take triplets or twins if they'll smile The Jefferson Starship learned that and, and recorded it. I made a whole bunch of money off of that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I got a big check. I said, what is this? <laughs> Not bad. My checks were usually $7 or $9.37. We said, this is like $1,600. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. So one of your first... Uh, sort of gigs after you uh, you went off to, to tour was was Newport. Yes. Tell us about that folk festival going there for oh, the first time. It was amazing. It was it was really wonderful. I in the first place I had by that time I had had festivals at home and I had invited a lot of people to come through town and I'd met a lot of really great folk singers and, and one of them was Jean Ritchie who just uh, returned the favor of me putting her up while her husband was sick and 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 welcoming welcoming her into Salt Lake City by welcoming me into the folk community in in New York and and around there and uh, and she introduced me to everybody and and she uh, just opened up whole worlds for me and I met all kinds of of people. I, I was talking before about, uh, I got to know Howling Wolf, who I brought eventually to Salt Lake City. And, and uh, I, I met him at the, at the, one of the festivals, I think it was Newport. And, and I got to stay up all night and listen to him picking out the tunes he was going to do and learning them with his band. He had a really hot band. And, and he had a bad kidneys and he wasn't even supposed to stand up and he would just like all of a sudden rise up and he'd always say, look at this, you know, the time. <laughs> and his head was bigger than most people, man. He was really just very fearsome, powerful looking guy. But basically, under all of that, he was extremely sweet-tempered, and I found that out at 5 o'clock in the morning when I, I couldn't sleep. I never sleep with things like that. I, I went in to have a cup of coffee, and, and he came and sat down. And he said, Good morning, little girl. You're looking really fine this morning. And I went, Ugh! <laughs> and I got up and ran out the door. And then I, I got outside and I thought, what, what am I doing? He just said, good morning, what the hell is the matter with me? And I went back in pretending I'd been looking for somebody and they weren't there yet. And sat down and he began to tell me all about growing up on a farm. And I mean, he was an incredibly charming and wonderful person. And, and he always remained that way all the time I, he was alive. And he always remembered me. When my kids got old enough to take in a bar in New York City, I always took them to see Howling Wolf. And I always took them to see Carmen McRae. Mm -hmm. New York was a blossom dearie. <laughs> yeah, th that was an incredible event for me. I never saw that many people 
who I wondered about as I'd been listening to folk music on records, what they would be like. Suddenly they were there in front of me and staying up all night and singing all night. The Clancy Brothers were there. Every damn buddy was there. Margaret Berry was there. Boy, she was one of my favorite singers I ever met in my life. It was it was extraordinary, and, and I felt very honored to be in that company. And you ended up also being on the the board of of Newport for. I did. For a while. I was on the board of the Newport Folk Festival for about three years, and I got to I got to pick out people I thought ought to go to the Newport Folk Festival, just like I got to go. You know? <laughs> it didn't last a long time. It 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 uh, actually the last year I was on the board. They ran out of money and got into a whole lot of trouble, and, and it just collapsed, and, and they couldn't put it back together for quite a long time. It was never the same. One of the things that was really great about the Newport Folk Festival was that everybody got paid the same, no matter who they were. If it was Janis Joplin or if it was me, you got, I think, something like $50 a day plus travel and and all your board and room and and it was and and you they always tried to pick somebody you would never meet in your life to be your roommate and my roommate was Fannie Lou Hamer I don't know if you know who that was but that was the mo that really changed my life Fannie Lou Hamer was a black woman who who helped change the whole civil rights thing around and she was one of the greatest people in that movement and uh the very first night I was there, she had her little girl with her. It's about 11 years old. Had a slight limp, that little girl. And they went to bed fairly early, and I just loved to stay out all night and drink and raise hell, and that's what I did. I had some friends with me, and I went out and drank and raised hell and sang all night, and I got home, and the door was locked. And I pounded on the door and said in my charming and inimitable fashion, what the hell is this door doing locked? I live here too. <laughs> and she opened up the door and said, you come in here and sit down and I'll tell you some stuff. <laughs> and she sat me down and she said, you see this girl here? You notice how she limps? It's my little girl there. And they, they shot her in the leg because of the things I was saying down there. She she gives me about three quarters of an hour of that without stopping, you know, and I'm like, I felt like somebody threw me in a centrifugal force machine or something. You know? And she finishes all, and then she says with the sweetest, kindest smile, she says, so you see, where I come from, you got to lock the door. <laughs> And she and I became really great friends and corresponded for a long time. I had a tremendous admiration for her. I can sing you a song she taught me too. Mm -hmm. I can sing how it goes. Mm. Oh, I'm probably not going to be able to call it back. I shouldn't say things like that. I'll sing you a song she taught me and then I'll say how it did go. <laughs> I can't, I can't get it, but, but she sang mostly kind of gospel songs that had been turned into civil rights songs, and, and, and they were all incredibly powerful, and, and, and she could, just with no accompaniment or anything, just stand up there and clap her hands and move people to action. I'm no joke, you know, she was just strong, great woman. What a neat thing to be able to meet her. Think about her a lot. Now, what about songwriting? You've sung us a couple of the songs that you wrote, uh, particularly for kids. Mm -hmm. um, what was the relationship between your songwriting at first and, and the traditional songs that you were collecting and singing? Well, I can show you. Uh, at, at first, a lot of the songs that I thought were any good at all um, were based on traditional forms. And I tried to uh, to keep that true, but I also like jazz a lot, and, and I like all kinds of different songs, and eventually my songwriting became what it is. It's a personal expression, and it uses all different kinds of things. But, but I can show you um, 
how true I could be to some of the forms I started out with. I really think this is a good song that I wrote. I wrote it. I ought to be able to just start right out and sing it. These are the bells of Ireland that in my garden grow. My great-grandmother brought those seeds from Ireland long ago. The music, it is wild and sad like orphan angels sing. And you must listen in your soul to hear the bells of Ireland ring. I've never been to Ireland, though I sing of the cool green shores, and I dream I must have lived there some century before, and I'll weep for the blood and the troubles, oh, I'll tend my garden well. Let the sweet green bells of Ireland I'll ring the bells of hell And these are the bells of Ireland And in my garden grow My great-grandmother brought those seeds From Ireland long ago The music, it is wild and sad Like orphan angels sing and you must listen in your soul to hear the bells of Ireland ring. How many of you have ever seen the bells of Ireland? A, a lot of people, it's not, a, it's not easy to grow. And I, I grew some this year in my garden that are up there drying now. They dry very, it's a long, it's a stock flower that grows. Well, it doesn't grow as tall as larkspur or something, or, or even, uh, you know, delphinium. It it's, grows about that tall, usually, although you can, you know, if you really work on it, you can get them a little taller. And, and it has these beautiful little flowers that are shaped like little horns. They look like you could maybe play a tune on them if you blew into them. But the thing that's the most amazing about them is that they're green. The, the blossom is green. It's green as the heart of spring. And, uh, and I think it's a magic flower. And um, I, I try every year to grow it. And about f every four years, I get it to come up in profusion. And I always dry, dry them. And I always keep them all. And they, when they dry, they get really fragile. And, and the heart of the f flower always stays green until it falls off the stalk. So the rest of it kind of turns a kind of pretty gold wheat color. It's just really, really a magic flower. So why don't you sing that with me? These are the bells of Ireland and in my garden grow. My great-grandmother brought those seeds from Ireland long ago. The music it is a wild and sad like orphan angels sing. And you must listen in your soul to hear the bells of Ireland ring one more time. These are the, the bells of Ireland that in my garden grow. These are the bells of Ireland that in my garden grow. My great-grandmother brought those seeds from Ireland long ago. The music, it is wild and sad like orphaned angels sing. And you must listen in your soul to hear the bells of Ireland ring. The music, it is wild and sad like orphaned angels sing. And you must listen in your soul to hear the bells of Ireland ring. <laughs> That's a pretty traditional theme, and it's mm -hmm. a pretty traditional tune. It's very like any number of Irish tunes I've heard, and, and I've certainly heard a lot of those. Even while I was in Ireland, I heard. <laughs> well, we've talked about a, a couple of people who were big influences on you, and there were a couple of others that you've mentioned to me before. 
Um, one was Kate Wolf. Talk about Kate a little bit. Oh, yes. Kate was one of the nicest people I ever met in my life, and she was a beautiful soul. And she died very young. She was only 45 when she died, but she had by that time already made a big impression on everybody. She was, uh, she wrote songs about California, and she, she liked California a lot, and a lot of people make fun of California, but she sang about the golden, ro golden rolling hills of California, and she, she was a real Californio. And uh, uh, she, she began to travel all around the country and, and sing to more people, and, and she traveled with me some, and she traveled with Bruce Phillips quite a bit, and, and she got introduced to people in Texas and all kinds of, I, I loved going to Texas. I mean, first time I sang there is a whole bunch of cowboys all jumping up and down, singing Let's Boogie, and, and one of them jumped up on a chair and said, sing something about Texas, darling. You know. I said, oh, honey, I'm from Idaho, but we have a panhandle, too. <laughs> and they all just immediately showed me how sweet they could be and sat down and, and sang along with me and were great. I love Texas. <laughs> and it's pretty much that way everywhere. If, if, you, if you don't get your back up and, and try to make friends with them often, it's really easy. <laughs> you just invite them in. You know, and, and uh, Kate was really good at that. And when she died, everybody was incredibly sad. She had leukemia, and she just went pretty quick, and it was hard to believe she was gone, and so we didn't want her to be gone. And, and we started having a festival for Kate Wolf every year in Northern California up, and it, now it's up. It, it was, for a while, it was uh, closer to San Francisco. Or just, where was it? It was Petaluma or some, you know, one of those towns up there. And, and uh, then they, they moved it up to, uh, you know where Laytonville is? No. It's, uh, it's up in Northern California. And it's, it's uh, Laytonville is, is this little town that's right by where the Grateful Dead used to have their complex. And it's a really great place to do a, a festival. I mean, there's really room to, to have the five or six thousand people who always come. <laughs> In fact, sometimes I think there have been maybe more like ten. And, and uh, Cloud Moss, who puts that festival on, is uh, uh, is just determined that every nobody will forget Kate, you know. And and everybody remembers her with pleasure. And and I get to close that festival every year. I always sing this song that, that Kate taught me. And this year, I took a couple of guys from Boise uh, who play jazz here in the Grape Escape on Sunday. If you had, don't have anything to do on Sunday, you should just pop right over there and hear them. Ben Burdick and Bill Lyles. And Bill played a Clevenger, which is an electric bass, and, and Ben played a, an electric guitar, and, and they don't look with favor on that, but uh, they're so good. <laughs> it was just impossible for them to uh, harbor those feelings. And, and uh, when I closed it this year, they played and everybody sang. They were all lying there in the moonlight, all blissed out from the festival. And, and when we started to sing, I told them they had to sing with me, and they did and I'll sing it to you, and you should sing it with me, too. It's really easy to learn. The chorus goes, give yourself to love. I'm going to jack that up a little bit. I sing too low for everybody. It says, give, give yourself to love. As, if love is what you're after, open up your hearts to the tears and the laughter, and just give yourself to love. Give yourself to love. Give yourself to love, give yourself to love, give yourself to love, if love is what you're after, open up your hearts to the tears and the laughter and just give yourself to love, 
Give yourself to love. Give yourself to love. Give yourself to love. Kind friends all gather round. There's something I would say. What's brought us together has blessed us all today. Love has made a circle to keep us safe inside. Where strangers are as family and loneliness can't hide. Give yourself to love. Give yourself to love. If love is what you're after, open up your hearts. Open up your heart to the tears and the laughter and just give yourself to love. Give yourself to yourself to love give yourself to love I've walked these hills and mountains I've learned to love the wind I've been up before the sunrise to watch the day begin I always knew I'd find you but I never did know how like sunlight on some cloudy day you're here before me now come on and give yourself to love if love is what you're after and open up your hearts to the tears and the laughter oh just give yourself to love give yourself to love Give yourself to love, give yourself to love now. Love is born in fire, it's planted like a seed. And love can give you everything, but it can give you what you need. Love comes when you are ready, it comes when you're afraid. It can be your greatest teacher and the best friend you have made. Come on and give yourself to love. If love is what you're after, open up your hearts to the tears and the laughter and just give yourself to love. Give yourself to love. Give yourself to love, give yourself to love. And I think there's, there's one more person we need to talk about whom you've mentioned twice already, and that is Bruce Utah Phillips. Uh -huh. His latest album is a collection of his songs. Yeah, my, about two years ago, when Bruce was sick and we were all worried about helping him with his finances, a whole lot of people did benefits for him. And, and I, I started this project of making this album of, of some of his songs. I, I knew a lot of his songs. I knew him for 55 years and, and uh, I knew songs he didn't remember that he wrote. <laughs> in fact, some of the time he would get really pissed off at me because I remembered something he wrote that he didn't want to hear about anymore. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes he didn't like the way I sang his songs because I changed them. And I tried to re remind him that that's what makes a song a folk song is when somebody remembers it differently and, and sings it that way and then it just goes into the the mainstream, you know, and it becomes a folk song, and, and he would grump. But uh, mostly I think he was pleased that I rescued some of those songs or, or sang them all over. I can't think of anybody's songs I'd rather sing. And, and the ones that I liked were often the ones that were more personal. He, he didn't sing them himself. He never, he sang them to me and, and then I would sing them and because he sang them to me and I thought they were great and, and then he would grump, you know. 
But uh, they're beautiful, just incredible poetry and beautiful songs and, and some of the best love songs I ever heard. And, and also, the, the one song I really hated the most and that you sang was uh, Rock Salt and Nails. And, and he wrote that after his first wife ran off with a banjo player, causing him to have a severe bad reaction to bluegrass music forever after. <laughs> And everybody and his dog has recorded that song. I mean, Joan Baez recorded it. And uh, my favorite person who records Levon Helm, boy, he really knows how to sing that song. It's a killer. You know, groups sang it. Lester Flatt and Earl Scruggs recorded it. It's rock salt and nails. I sing it to you. <laughs> I'm really sorry about that, Bruce. <laughs> Great song. On the banks of the river Where the willow hangs down Wild birds all wobble With a low moaning sound Down in the Listen to the lies that you told. Now I lie on my bed and I see your sweet face. The past I remember. Your conscience still echoes my name, and now the nights are so long, and the sorrow runs deep. Nothing is worse than a night without sleep. If your ladies was blackbirds and your ladies was thrushes, I lie there for hours in the cold chilly marshes. And if your ladies was squirrels. I'd fill out my shotgun with rock salt and nails. And, you know, time has flown by, and I think it may be time for your last go round. Sing you another one at Bruce's, though, just to show you that. Well, as, as long as everyone here is willing, you can. <laughs> All right. Well, he used to write songs whenever something really grabbed him out of the news or what was going on. And, and uh, he wrote a lot of stuff about Utah. And, and I mean, he wrote a lot of labor songs and stuff like that. That's what he's really known for. He, he didn't sing a lot of those other songs all the time. He'd, he'd make them up, and then he'd just just let them go and, and never sing them again. 
And one of those songs was uh, one of the most extraordinary songs I've ever heard, like on, on the subject it's on and everything. It's, it's called Jesse's Corrido. And it was about a young Mexican kid named Jesse Garcia who, uh, who was sent to prison. He'd killed his uh, niece. Nobody ever knew exactly how it happened. He, he, they were wrestling around, and and she just ended up dead. And and he got sent to prison for manslaughter. And he was only 16 years old. He was a kid too, you know. I mean, really not formed yet, and didn't know exactly what was going on. And and he was terribly misused in prison. And. Um, he was convicted of murder. Was the two other, there were two other guys. While he was there, uh, he and these two other guys killed one of the prisoners who was threatening them. And, and uh, you know, it was the one of the, and they were all convicted of, of murder. And, and um, one of them was uh, sentenced to life. But Jesse and Mac Merrill Rivenberg were sentenced to death. And uh, in Utah, they, they give you your choice. Um, I don't know if they still do that now, but, but then they stop doing that. Well, they, they say, would you rather be hanged or shot? And most people would always choose shooting because it somehow seemed cleaner and more uh, brave, you know, somehow. It's a dumb idea. <laughs> Those guys, they, they ch chose the people for the execution squads out of volunteers. You didn't even have to prove you could shoot straight. It was a messy sort of way to do it, I think. And, and But I don't know about the other alternative either. <laughs> Hanging doesn't sound so attractive. None of it sounds attractive to me. And Bruce and I were both very much involved in anti-capital punishment stuff all the whole time, which just made everybody mad at us. And. Uh, The, the night before they were to be executed, I mean, this took about four years of going back and forth and more more legal going on and everything. And, and he got to be in his 20s before it was decided they were really going to die. And uh, the night before they were to be executed, Mac Merrill Rivenberg committed suicide in his cell. And I don't know, the next morning they just somehow decided uh, probably they didn't have the stomach for doing Jesse in. You know, he was a kid still, really. So they commuted his sentence to life in prison, and they put him in solitary confinement. For, for a couple of years, he was in solitary confinement. And... Uh, The night that he was supposed to be executed, before Bruce found out about that, he wrote this song because he thought he was going to be executed. And it's just an incredible song. It says, On the corners together you'll find us. By the lampposts at night we'll be there. Our spirits like smoke that blows through the night. Restless and going nowhere. Trouble is all we can give you. Trouble is all we have known. Our lives like water that runs through our hands, leaving us unloved and alone. Our fathers, they say, were just like us. Our children will all be the same. With hair like black leather and skin brown as wood. Speaking a low Spanish name. Remember our mothers that gave us our lives like grass in the spring of their years. 
They left us behind their hearts light as wine, their breasts undissolved in our tears. The things that I do are all very bad things, and I do them and then don't know why. You hold up your sons with their blue or brown eyes, and you tell me they're better than I. And my friends, they too all despise me. I do all the wrongs they had planned, and all that I have for the years of my life is a cross that I carved on my hand. They put me in jail behind iron bars, and you'll find me with blood on my hands. And tomorrow I'll stand up in front of the guns, and I'll give you the life you demand. But tonight when you sit at your table with your wife and your child close by, recall this corridor my red blood has made. And now, mi amigos, goodbye. Jesse Carrito. Okay, you want the last go around? Sure. Okay. Well, this is another song of mine, and I'll finish with this one. I wrote this song for Ken Kesey, who was my friend. I'd gone to a big party that he threw for a book he was he was publishing and, and or what well he wasn't Viking was but, and uh, it was an amazing party there are a thousand people there mostly very young I think thought they were going to a rock and roll party which was actually true because the Grateful Dead were, were going to come but Jesse got, got sick so uh, he just went over to Eugene and got all the kids who played music to come and, and everybody he could find. And I was there and Jack Elliott was there, Alan Jack. And uh, Ann Waldeman, the poet, was there. And so there was a lot of, I mean, Kesey told stories all day and, and, and everybody sang and, and then he told a really long story. And uh, it, it was one of the most amazing things I ever went to. And uh, when we all went back way after midnight to to talk at the end, you know, and have something to eat, he he told me he was going to write a book about uh, cowboys, and, and he was going to call it the last go round. And. Uh, and it's really a great book, by the way. I don't think it gets read nearly enough. It's really a, a good, rattling good story, and he could really tell one. And uh, and uh, the last line of the first chapter is whistling down the rusty rails of my memory. And it, so this song came to me, Just I wrote two verses and, and I called him up and I said, you have to listen to this, you're responsible for it. And I, I was singing it to people and they liked it and, and I wanted him to say it was okay and he listened to it. I drove all the way over to his house from my house, which was like all the way across Oregon. <laughs> and he said, it's not finished. <laughs> I said, what? He said, it's a, it's a rodeo book. You don't have a rodeo verse. And, and he gave me the uncorrected proof and told me, you read it and find a line you like and steal it and write a rodeo verse. And so I took that line and the middle verses. And he liked it, too. He said it was OK if I sang it. <laughs> it's called My Last Go Round. One sweet love. Have I come by on my last go round? 
soft caresses, tender sighs have my heart unbound. I have stumbled, lost and wild onto sacred ground. Just like a child on my last go round and riding down the rusty rails of my memory, all those honky tonks and whiskey. to me. We drank the river, we rode the twister, we tumbled down to the ground, but we'll rake and dry, we'll spend a glory so much. Thank you so much, Rosalie. Once more, that was Rosalie Sorrells, and here she is. She, I, I should say that Rosalie has recorded 75 albums. No, 25. Uh, 25, 25, I'm sorry, 25 albums. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> I knew that was wrong. But yeah, no, 25 albums, um, which is, uh, you know, a lot of albums, but she has a selection of them here, which uh, you would be able to buy if you approached her with the proper funds. So that's the subtle way that I'm going to put this. But so she's got a table over there. It also has some DVDs and a couple of her books as well, or one of her books anyway, which is really her mother's book that she edited. Um, so, uh, so, Please do come over and say hi to Rosalie and, and conduct any commerce that you'd like to do. Thanks once again for coming. Yes. And, uh,